BuzzFeed is a site that is, um, the premise of BuzzFeed is that we um, are a media company for the social age. Um, our distribution comes from people sharing. Um, it wasn't possible a few years ago to build a, a site with 40 million unique visitors, um, primarily from social and people sharing content, but now it is. And um, we have um, uh, about 60% of our readers, 18 to 34, who are the most active people on these kinds of platforms. And over 40% of our traffic is mobile. So we've seen a, this big shift to mobile. Um, we have kind of witnessed on the web the shift from portals to search to social. Um, I kind of miss the portals uh, era, but um, we grew Huffington Post very rapidly through search, and BuzzFeed has been growing very rapidly through social. Um, one of the big questions I've been thinking about for over a decade now is how do ideas spread? Why do some ideas that don't seem that good spread to huge audiences? Some things that you think are gonna work great um, don't go anywhere. You, we're all in information-based businesses where we'll green light something, and if it, people talk about it and share it with each other, it reaches millions of people. And if people don't, even if we have a huge marketing budget, it's hard to really have success. Um, I like to, um, one concept that kind of goes through the talk is this idea of the board at work network. There's literally millions of board office workers who spend half of their day working and half of their day on Facebook, on Twitter, <laughs> sharing media, IMing each other, emailing each other. Collectively, that you can reach more people through the Board at Work network than the BBC reaches or NBC or CBS or any of the major networks, literally hundreds of millions of people um, that initially weren't even aware that they were creating a network, but, but are now the biggest network in the world. Um, more recently, the Board in Line network. So I used to hate mobile because mobile is what stopped things from going viral. So if you think back to the dark ages of mobile, you couldn't even send a text message to someone who was on a different carrier. Um, more recently, uh, you know, even a few years ago, you would email someone an article and they couldn't view it because they had a Blackberry, they had the wrong kind of phone, they couldn't watch video. You, you, were you, know, you get emails back saying, I'll look at this when I go to get to my office. That, so mobile stopped things from going viral. Now you see that Facebook and Twitter have the majority of their re re users on mobile and, if it, and really mobile and social have converged and that's the way things spread. It's through people seeing them on their mobile device and passing them on to their friends. And if mobile doesn't work, uh, if your mobile web um, doesn't work and if people can't view your content on the mobile web, it can't spread, it can't go viral, it can't go anywhere, it just stops dead. Um, so it's really flipped in the last few years. Um, I got into this stuff um, through some early experiments. Um, the first half of when I was a grad student at the <coughs> MIT Media Lab, I was procrastinating writing my master's thesis, which is what graduate students do. Um, and Nike had just launched Nike ID, which was a service where you could customize your Nike shoes. I, being a smart ass, tried to customize my shoes with the word with the word sweatshop. Uh, Nike didn't like that idea, and they wrote back and said that it was another party's um, trademark or was inappropriate slang. Um, I, I responded and said that it meant a shop or factory where workers toil under unhealthy conditions, that it's been in the dictionary for uh, you know, over 100 years, and that it was actually a word, and they wrote back another excuse, and we kind of went back and forth. And at the end of our exchange, um, they said, well, we reserve the right to not send, send you the shoes, and I said, that's fine. Um, but can you at least send me a pic, I'll change the ID, but can you at least send me a picture of the 12 year old Vietnamese girl who stitches them together? Um, and they didn't write back. So this was before YouTube, before blogs, before, before Twitter, before people thought about things going viral, but I pasted it together and I sent it to a few friends just because I thought my friends would be interested. And if you remember back to 2001, there was something called email forwards where people would email everyone in their address book. Fortunately, people don't do that too much anymore. But my friends started emailing it to their friends, and they emailed it to their friends. Eventually, activists started to get it and post it to lists. Um, reporters started to get it and writing about the story. Um, and it became one of these early email forwards that reached millions of people. And I ended up meeting all these people who had f dedicated their lives to fighting for human rights. Um, and I actually knew very little about the sweatshop issue. I met all these people who were passionate about it, but somehow I still ended up on the Today Show with Katie Couric talking about sweatshop <laughs> labor and uh, with Nike's head of global PR um, ha having a debate. And I'm sitting here thinking, why am I here instead of someone who actually knows about this issue and didn't just read a couple articles in the New York Times? Um, and the reason was that I made something that ordinary people wanted to share. Um, but the grad student the next in my ne an office over from me said, well, these things are, f are freak network effects. You can't reproduce them. So of course, that was a challenge. And I teamed up with my sister to create the New York City rejection line. The idea behind the rejection line was a, it was a, it's a phone number where if someone is hitting on you and they won't take no for an answer, um, you can give them a local number, your number, and when they call, they get an automated rejection message. So um, 
the, the outgoing message says that the person who gave you this doesn't actually want to see you again. You can press one to speak to a comfort specialist. You can press <laughs> two to hear a sad poem written by a kindred spirit. Um, or press three to cling to the unrealistic hope a relationship still possible. Um, and we had stand-up comics record each of them. Um, and because uh, people, people uh, shared it with each other, we became experts on relationships. And so here's me and my sister on CNN talking about relationships. Um, after that, we created something called blackpeopleloveus.com. The idea <laughs> of this site was that the, Sally and Johnny, our two whitest friends who we recruited to play the, the role of Sally and Johnny, um, are so proud of having black friends that they created a whole website celebrating it with testimonials from their black friends, like Sally loves to touch my hair. She always asks me how I got my hair to do that. That makes me feel special. Or Johnny calls me demand. That puts me at ease. Um, or <laughs> is that roof high enough, or does it need to be raised? Johnny gets props from a close friend. Um, so this um, was a, a project we did. and. Um, told a few people, and I sort of scientifically tracked as it spread. We intentionally didn't blast it out to many people, and, and we ended up um, <laughs> having this awkward uh, meeting on the Good Morning America with an African American who thought the site was hilarious and one who thought it was offensive, because media needs to be balanced in the US. Um, <laughs> so, um, so after doing these projects, which were, were really, for, for me, um, a kind of research, and for my sister, a venue for comedy. She's a stand-up comic. Um, uh, people started asking me, well, what's the trick? How do you make this things, go, things go viral? I have a project I want to go viral. And I think the biggest misconception people had was that the, the way to do it was to focus on quality, that quality is all that matters. If you make something that's really high quality, it'll, be, um, it'll go viral. And the truth is that quality helps you a lot. If you have an original idea or you do something that's clever or unique, or, um, that helps. But there's tons of really high quality things that don't go anywhere and don't really spread much. Um, case in point, which is a higher quality religion, Judaism or Mormonism? <laughs> so uh, show of hands for Judaism. We're very, it's almost Passover. Anyone, anyone going to support the Jews? Very, very little support. OK. <laughs> Mor Mormonism. Any, 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 yeah, we got one. Woo. All right. So we don't have to decide definitively which is a higher quality religion, but I think we can agree that Judaism is a very high quality religion. Thousands of years of tradition, a rich history. And yet, when you look at the performance metrics, you can see <laughs> that since 1950, the Jews have barely increased their population. And meanwhile, the Mormons, there was, there was one Mormon for every 10 Jews. Now there's more Mormons in the world than there are Jews. Now why is that? Why, why, is it because Mormonism is a much higher quality religion? Um, that doesn't really make sense. That, that doesn't explain this difference. The real reason is that Mormons, um, someone likes this slide. Should I point this in any particular direction? It just stopped working. We can sit and look at this one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll sing. We'll sing for five minutes. No. Now it'll go for the next one. So the reason is that Mormons, so any, I don't know if there's anyone who can help with this, but the, the reason is that, uh, that uh, is it down here? Maybe it ran out of battery or something? OK. The reason is that Mormons actually focus half their time on practicing their religion, and the other half of their time, uh, okay, we're, we're moving, um, the other half of the time on how to, how to spread their religion. So they have a mission for two years where they convert people. They keep track of their conversion rates. They actually know, like, how many people have I successfully converted? Um, and they realize that, that, that the idea matters, but so does the uh, mechanism for spreading the idea. And too often in media, in advertising, in any kind of information-based economy, people spend 90% of their time thinking about the idea and falling in love with the idea. And then as they're getting up from the conference room table, feeling chuffed with themselves, they, they say, how do we promote this? Like, what is the, what is the um, you know, oh, should we send a tweet out or should we post it on our Facebook wall? Um, and they spend, they should, you should spend an equal amount of time thinking about how the idea is going to spread as you do um, the, about the idea itself. So how do we do it at BuzzFeed? Um, fitting with the theme of this conference, we um, really combined art and science. You need to have great creative ideas and make great content, but you also need to have an idea for how that content's going to spread. And some of the science that we use is um, an equation from epidemiology. This is, uh, is a simple model of how infectious diseases spread, but also can explain content on the internet. Um, you get an R value by multiplying the probability of something being shared um, times the average number of people it's shared with. So if many people are sharing something, but they're only sharing it with a small number, that's basically equivalent as if a small percentage of people are sharing, but they're sharing it with a really large number. 
Um, and so that allows you to take individual pieces of content and say, okay, we've published all this content, which piece of content should we send extra promotion to? What should we leave on the homepage longer? What should we post to Facebook or to Twitter? Which things should we promote? And if something has a higher R value, it means that when you send 100 people there, you're gonna get another 100 people, you're gonna get another 150 people um, sharing it with their friends, and there's a better return on, your promo on the promotion. Um, we also use things like machine learning because it's more complicated than just R values. Um, a site like Twitter has a half-life of an hour, so you'll see a spike in traffic. That doesn't mean you necessarily wanna promote that because Twitter is very um, quick and it might cr uh, crash very quickly. Um, the same traffic coming from Facebook means a lot more because Facebook has a half-life of about a day. Pinterest has a half-life of about a week. And so using math, we can weight all these things so we can get a sense of what's gonna happen in the future and be more uh, predictive about it. Um, and then also we have these dashboards, and this sort of shows the BuzzFeed worldview. The blue is showing how much we promoted something, and the red is the extra we're getting from people sharing. And by giving editors the ability to look at this kind of uh, data, they get better about um, generating intuitions um, about what's going to spread. Um, the other thing that I think is really important that people forget is what spreads depends a lot on, um, depending on the platform. We like to think of ourselves as these unified selves with consistent tastes and interests, but we all behave very differently depending on the context. In the real world, it might be who you're hanging out with or where you are. On the web, um, Google and Facebook behaviors are very different. Um, the Google worldview, I think, is well understood. People, can, um, it's about connecting people with information. It's kind of solitary. You're sitting there looking at the search box, there's something you want, you put it into the search box, it gives you links back, and then you click and you get the information that you wanted in your head. Um, so a very smart uh, group of people created something called about.com years ago when there was not a media company for the, for the search age. Google was on the rise, and they realized that people were entering things in Google and there was no results because there wasn't someone making content for Google. And about.com was one of the, the first sites to do this. So people type into Google, how do I get rid of my slice in golf? About.com has the page. Um, people type in, how do I stop oily skin? And you get the results there. I see. A few of you, there's, it's kind of bright, but I see a few of you have oily skin, and, and this <laughs> might be a useful <laughs> reference for you so I can leave it up a second longer. Okay, uh, Facebook is, um, is, is a juggernaut, but I think it's still poorly understood. People sometimes are c confused why content is on Facebook. They'll look at their Facebook newsfeed and like, why is that there? And I think that um, it's because Facebook is about connecting with people in your life, not just about the information of the content. Google is very informational. Facebook is much more emotional and about relationships with other people. And so when you look at these pictures of Basset Hounds running, um, you, this, isn't what, this isn't what Larry and Sergey had in mind when they created Google. Nobody types in, I wanna see some pictures of Basset Hounds running, unless they've already heard about them or discovered them somewhere else. But Basset Hounds turn out to work very well on the social web because they're both cute and LOL. Um, and so here's a BuzzFeed post with over a million views. And the reason people share it is because um, humor is inherently social. You think about it, if you go out with your friends, you all have dinner, everyone's telling jokes, you're all laughing. The next day, you don't remember the specific jokes. You remember that you sat with your friends and laughed and you feel closer to your friends. Or when you go home for the holidays and the family dog runs up, everyone gathers around, pets the dog, and they feel closer to the dog but they also uh, feel closer to their family. And for most families, the dog petting moment is the highlight of the family weekend, and then it's just all downhill the rest of the weekend. <laughs> um, and so what you're seeing on Facebook is just a, a um, massive uh, amount of people using content to communicate and connect with each other, um, not just for the informational value of the content. And we even have these reactions on Buzz, BuzzFeed where with one click you can express the emotion, because these are a lot truer to why people share than, um, than uh, uh, the information in the content. Um, and we see these sort of streams of people reacting on BuzzFeed. Um, that, and once people have reacted, they're much more likely to share. Um, some other BuzzFeed content that fits this, uh, talk, about void, uh, talk about the Board at Work Network, 13 simple steps to get you through a rough day. If Brittany can make it through 2007, I can make it through this day. You can print that up and put it over your office. Um, you can be glad you're not a guy getting chased by an ostrich, or you can look at the hedgehog wearing a tiny hat. And all these things will make you feel better, but not only that, when you share with your friend who's also at bored at work, they will see it and they'll feel better, and they'll write back to you and say, thank you for sending this to me, I needed that, and they'll pass that on to their friends, um, and so on. Um, here, um, after, after the terrible shooting in, at Sandy Hook, um, lots of people in the U.S. And, and other places in the world who were, who were reading about it felt kind of hopeless about humanity and like, how could this happen? 
And we published this the next day, which was 26 moments that restored our faith in humanity. Um, and, you know, including this is a kid in a wheelchair whose parents built his Halloween costume around his wheelchair so he could have, like, the coolest Halloween costume in school, um, or a rugby player visiting his biggest fan. And people were sharing this almost therapeutically, saying, I needed this, the, the, you know, I, I, I was feeling so depressed, I needed something like this. Um, and sometimes it's serious content, like the 45 most powerful images of the year, which was, you know, the 9-11 memorial opening and, and the tsunami in Japan and the Arab Spring, and that was, uh, is one of our biggest posts. Um, so, but as social took over the world, we realized it wasn't just about this pure emotional content. Um, the Facebook started about being updates from your friends and, and you know, your, your friends getting drunk or your friend's baby or um, um, internet memes or animals or things like that. But it's really evolved to be about all kinds of content. So we hired um, Ben Smith from Politico as our editor-in-chief, our, our, our first editor-in-chief, and he hired an amazing team of reporters. Um, he, we broke our first scoop three days in that McCain was endorsing Romney. At first, CNN didn't credit us because they thought we were a Basset Hound running type site and not a site you have to credit on political scoops. But quickly, people on Twitter said, hey, you got to credit BuzzFeed. They broke this, this news. And then we um, you know, just were off to the races, um, adding lots of informational content to the emotional content on our site. We just published a book this year by Michael Hastings. Um, and we've been... Um, you know, expanding and launching verticals in all different sections, really building an emo the emotional, a matrix with emotional content and informational content and combining the two. Um, we have expanded by, uh, recently by opening a studio in LA um, to do on YouTube what we've done on Facebook. So um, um, we already are off to a great start with lots of videos getting several million views. Um, and uh, Zay Frank, one of the real pioneers in online video, is our, it, we acquired his company and now he's um, EVP of video for us. Um, and then we opened a Hollywood bureau um, to cover the entertainment industry. We're based in New York, by the way. <laughs> um, and, um, and soon we will uh, be opening BuzzFeed UK. Um, these are uh, the, the, the four folks who will start that, that uh, bureau for us. Um, and we already have over 2 million readers in the UK, and so really our focus with this UK expansion is to serve those readers better, to replace football with football, to you know, do other things to, to make the, the content really speak to a UK audience. Um, so one, one thing that I think is good news for journalism, we don't have that much time, so I'm going to go fast, is, is uh, the aggregation, how much, how much faster, really you fast. Just, no, 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 you're fine. It's okay. We're loving so, it. We're so loving it. <laughs> aggregation worked for, uh, for search, um, but... Scoops and quality reporting really work much better for social. Google's algorithm can't tell the difference between a, rewrite, a rewritten piece stuffed with keywords and the original scoop written by a great journalist. But on Twitter, people can tell the difference. No one's going to retweet the, 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 rewrite, the rewritten piece stuffed with keywords. They're going to retweet the, the, the scoop that was done by the great reporter. Uh, and, and, and so I think that there's a great opportunity to... Um, to invest in journalism and reporting like um, um, for the social web. And we've been hiring a lot of reporters. And they do great work. And they also get a lot of traffic because the social web it lends itself to that kind of work. But people will still sometimes ask us, how can the same site publish this? We were the first to report that Obama took a secret trip to Afghanistan. Um, and also publish this, 33 animals who are extremely disappointed <coughs> in you. Um, you know, doesn't this, doesn't this dumb down our, you know, doesn't this dumb down the site? Doesn't it cut into our credibility? And um, oh, keep that slide up there. And yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, our answer to that is really that publishing has become like a Paris cafe, where you show up to the cafe table with a copy of of Sartre and a copy of Le Monde and you're reading about philosophy, you're reading the news of the day, and there's always a dog under the next table, and when you bend down to pet the dog, you don't become stupid, it's just part of being human. When you turn away from the philosophy to flirt with someone at the next table or to gossip about something trivial, it doesn't make you any less smart. Nobody wants to take their philosophy book and go read it by themselves in the library. It's just not a fun, it's not, that's not the f a fun way to do it. So we really have said, let's embrace all the things that make us, make, make, make us human, even, though, even if that is sometimes diverse and contradictory content. This, for example, is how I read my, drink my coffee every morning. This is just a, a candid shot. Um, <laughs> this, 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 um, and, if you're, and if you, by the way, are saying, you know what, I'm a very serious-minded, tough-minded journalist. I didn't go to ju journalism school to do stuff about kittens, and I don't care that, you, you, that BuzzFeed mixes that kind of content. 
The truth is, even that person doesn't have a choice because social is the new starting point. People are getting news and information from Facebook and from Twitter. And if you look at your Facebook news feed, it has the cute animal next to the long form journalism, next to your friend getting drunk, next to um, you know, an uh, internet meme. All that stuff is mixed together. So social media has already created a Paris Cafe experience, particularly for younger readers, that has become the norm. And we, as a publisher, are just doing it at the source instead of, uh, instead of um, seeding that entirely to the social networks. Um, so edit was first. I'm going to go fast through advertising. Um, but now there's a big shift to social coming to advertising. At BuzzFeed, 100% of our revenue comes from social content marketing. We don't run banner ads. We have um, units that are powered by our same CMS, our same technology. Brands have to have, be held to a higher bar where they are making content that people actually want to click on and read. Um, the, you can see that we mark things. We have the traditional church and state separation. Our editors never touch branded content, but the same technology is powering both. And, and brands are having to learn to be more like publishers. They, we, we color things in the Google yellow. We label things, but they have a thumbnail, a headline. They get a post that needs to hold people's attention. We work with every brand that wants to um, distribute their social content on the web. Um, which is you know, a large number. Here's a case study from Virgin Mobile. Ten movie plots that would have been completely changed had they had cell phones. <laughs> Die Hard. Hello, LOEPD. Uh, Home Alone. You can get that joke just by the top of Macaulay Culkin's head. Uh, <laughs> um, we, uh, when Instagram came to, um, came, came to um, Android, uh, Virgin Mobile, which was selling an Android phone, did things you don't want to post on Instagram, like your self shots and your garbage. Um, and then we give them the dashboard that shows them how much um, earned media they're getting from people sharing their branded content. In this case, much more from people sharing than, than from the paid, paid seeding that they did. Um, and we also have done research showing that word of mouth marketing works, and you can measure it on the web better than you've ever been able to measure it before. And it has a good benefit. This kind of advertising has a huge benefit to the advertiser. Here's something for Toyota Prius, the 20 coolest hybrid animals for Toyota Prius. This is, you know, Toyota Prius cars are cool, but so are Ligers and Donkras and Beefaloes. Um, a brand like Toyota is realizing that they need to speak the language of the web, and so they work with us to do that. A few years ago, they, they uh, never would have done something like this. It's pretty exciting to us that they're doing this kind of stuff now. Here's a time machine we did with GE where we um, made it possible to see BuzzFeed from the 1950s, 40s, 30s, all these different decades, and then we took um, old school GE ads from their archive, and that was the advertising for each decade, so the ads fit. Um, and we, when we were looking through those archives, we really realized that, that advertising was better back in this Mad Men era where people really cared about storytelling. They weren't trying to cram the ad into a banner. They had a whole page to tell a story. And we think social can bring back a golden age of advertising where we hold advertising to a higher bar and try to really tell a story with it. And we're just at the beginning of that, but I think it's a, a promising thing to go beyond the banner to, to, to better storytelling on the ad side. Um, finally, social is a way of thinking. It's not a trick. People sometimes ask me, how do I integrate with Facebook or do this or do that? Um, to make my numbers work. If you see the way that the social readers uh, worked, where, where there was a trick that, let, made, made, that made, uh, Washington Post and Guardian articles appear in your newsfeed, and then when you clicked them, you had to install some app, and then when you sh look, read something, it would share to your friends, and all those apps went like that, but then they crashed because it wasn't a good user experience, and it was more of a trick than a, a long-term in, um, in, engaging kind of interaction. So it's better to think long-term and to think about social um, and to think socially in a lot of different ways. So, um, you know, one, a few, a few pointers. You know, have a heart. People always try to be smart, but having emotional intelligence is is important as um, as intellectual um, ability. Um, you know, this is a note from a a, a, son, a son to his father. You are you are the best dad a boy could have. Thank you for uh, being my dad and for adopting me um, after he was recently adopted. Um, here's, a story, here's one um, about identity. Think about identity. People share stuff because it's about them. Some primetime show that 80% of people <coughs> sort of like doesn't get shared at all on the web, but something that only 10% of people feel passionate about gets shared a lot. If you're left-handed, you know what this is, which is when you write, left-handers write, it smears ink on their hand. If you see that and you're left-handed, you say, I can relate to this, I'm going to share this. And when you do that, um, you, you end up um, you know, getting more traffic and more engagement, even though it's something that only a niche group is interested in, because that niche group is passionate um, and, and their identity matters, it matters on the social web. Um, capture the moment. So we had an earthquake in New York about a year and a half ago. Um, I grew up in California, so to me it seemed very minor. Um, <laughs> but everyone was out on the street going, ah, like the world's ending. 
And of course, there was no damage, so ha an hour later, we had to post up the, the devastating damage of the <laughs> New York earthquake. And uh, this, is one, this is one example, you know, pictures that are a little bit out of, out, of, out of the way. And so if you can publish into the zeitgeist, if you can publish quickly and make something that is the thing that everyone is talking about and excited about, then, you know, uh, that is another, you know, great strategy. Um, cute animals de deserve respect. Animals are not about animals. Animals are about being human. If, any, if there's any Philip K. Dick fans if, you know, in, in, um, the, in Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was Blade Runner was based on, the question to figure out if someone is an alien is often about empathy towards animals. You see a turtle, it's flipped over on its back. What do you do? And if, if a, a human says, oh, I flip him over and pat him on the back and give him a little push, and an android is like, uh, why are you asking me that? And can't, can't understand. Um, me also, think about every serial killer like tortured animals when they were a kid. Like, when people complain to me about too many animals on BuzzFeed site, I always ask them whether they're a serial killer and a sociopath or whether, <laughs> or whether they're an android, you know, because like, <laughs> those are the two possibilities um, if you can't, can't relate to animals. Um, you know, humor is inherently social. Um, the printer is now called Bob Marley because it's always jamming. Um, when you laugh with people, you feel closer to them. Um, nostalgia is also very social. If you grew up with one of these, these this is a, a post about things you can't get anymore, like pep, Crystal Pepsi or, um, you know, it, it, people will share that because they remember a time in their life and they'll share with other people that they know who remember that time in their life. Um, and then human rights are, are social. You know, when, when you're on Facebook and you see injustice or you see something that's not fair, you want to share that both because you care about it and because it makes you look good that you care about people and you, that you're trying to make the world better. In contrast, um, the nude pictures of Scarlett Johansson, although people, people are very, very interested in looking at nude pics of Scarlett Johansson, um, you see huge search volume, you see huge clicks on sites about content like this, but you don't actually see people post on Facebook and Twitter like, I heard there was nude ScarJo pics, I have a little bit of time this weekend, can someone send them to me? Because um, if you post that on social media, you look like a sleazy, a sleazy guy. And so when you look at what people do on Facebook, it's, you know, join me in helping the people of Japan after the tsunami, and they might be at the simultaneously in the other window Googling nude Rihanna pictures, and that is, you know, doesn't mean they're not interested in one or the other, that one of them's disingenuous. It means that people are interested in different things when they're with everyone they know than they are when nobody's looking and they're looking at things on their own. Um, so to conclude, um, um, learn from the Mormons, have an idea but also a way to spread it. They're equally important. Um, understand your platform, different content spreads on Google and Facebook. Um, Google's for what you're interested in when no one's looking. Facebook is what, what, what you're interested in when everyone's looking. The big shift to social content is coming to advertising. Get ready for it. There's going to be a lot of changes happening in advertising. The banner ad was sort of a historical accident, and we're going to be moving past it in the industry. And then love the Paris Cafe. Stay close to what makes us human. You don't need these arbitrary walls and separations between different kinds of content. That's already um, becoming the norm to have these things mixed together on Facebook and Twitter. And that social is a new way of, of thinking. There's no tricks. You have to be human. And EQ is as important as IQ. At dawn we ride. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>